So the work is, um, is a survey of um, when I began using mu musical structure as a, um, as a basis for painting. So uh, the, one of the earliest ones is the square one over there, Kansas City, which um, I began, I first started looking at things like um, Jimi Hendrix solos. Right. I don't know if you remember, I was doing, I, I looked at guitar solos because I looked at them as um, sort of mini statements like a statement within a statement, a song, the whole song is a lot of information, so, um, and I like the correlation between what an artist does as a painter and a guitarist as a soloist, and, um, sort of an abstract relationship there, and um, so that's one of the earliest, 2002, I mean, yeah, that's right, 2002, um, the, the back wall in the other room, again, um, edge to edge, Stripes, um, they were sort of, you know, 2006, I mean, the five, two, seven, yeah. Um, like Netflix. And then some, <laughs> yeah. And then some of these come out of, I've done, I've done some paintings which um, actually come out of um, casual conversations with Dave, where, um, I don't know if you remember the time <laughs> you said, uh, you said, you know, nobody ever has any th paintings in the stairwell. You ought to do like a diagonal. Someone did a bunch of diagonal paintings as well, and they like perfectly matched people's like inclining stairs. Um, but they, they, they were like, and then I based them on de crescendos and decrescendos and um, there was sort of a reason. They always had a, an idea which seems um, casual but usually has a, a really good basis for it. And so did the round ones and um, the spirals were about five years ago, um, three, four years ago, they were in a sh and the art panels, um, they uh, were also about three, four years ago at um, Azusa Pacific University. And then this is more recent. I think I did this in the last year, the square one. Right oh, here. right. Pair of panels. So, um, yeah, I think it's a pretty good sort of survey of work from over the last 15 years and um, all of it based on um, music notation and music um, uh, composition as, as a basis for it. So, based on the math of music. Right. Yeah. So you, uh, you take the, uh, do you have a bar limit? Yeah, I do. Um, there was a uh, most of things. If I'm if I look at a solo, most of the things the, the, a, four, a forty-eight inch composition is usually about twelve bars. Right. For some reason, I like to work with four inches. It's a four represent nearly everything being pop that I usually look I look at is four four time, and for some reason, four inches right. sort of became my standard. So most of the time. Um, that's the basis. So this might be about 16 bars, and then the, the other things also common, you know, common size uh, length of solos too. So but, right, uh, and then I've done I've done really big, I've done paintings up to long whole songs up to 100 feet or 50 feet, um, and then compressed some in rows, but. But I still like working on the size that is um, common in the solo. Yeah. Anywhere from 12 to 24 bars, sometimes longer, but it depends, depends whose music I'm listening to and thinking about. So what are you listening to now? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, and you know, people, people always come to the studio and they go, what's this one? And then I've already forgotten. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been doing this. I've been doing some paintings lately where um, I, I found a, uh, an album uh, in a thrift store called Tone Poems of Colour, and it was from 1956. And lo and behold, it, it, what was amazing about it is that um, it's by Frank Sinatra, but he, he's conducting it. So at a time in the 56 when he was really into, uh, he was known for his acting and singing. Uh, he liked to do side projects where he conducted. So I found this, and, and, and it's an amazing album in, in that um, he collaborated with a lot of the big con uh, conduct or composers of the day, people like um, Nelson Riddle and Billy Mann and, right. and so on. And 
So there's this whole album of, of, of uh, compositions named after songs. So, and then th what I liked about the album was, although it sounds like a lot of old music, like right. movie music of the day, right? But none of them are really. It's not just dead. It's not. It's not expected. It's not like red's not ang. You know, ang. Right. It's not. And so that's why I appreciate about it. And it amazed me that um, you know, there's this moment where Frank Sinatra is a colorist too, and you know, and he has this album, and it's never seen an album where every song is colored. So. So that was the, the basis of work I've been doing now, which is um, paintings that are really strongly uh, focused on one color. And that's also in painting terms. I always find ways to do things as a painter that um, springboard from this sort of uh, the musical ideas as well. Because um, I think there's always been this sort of back and forth between music and uh, art, painters and music, musicians and painters and so on. And so um, Bridget Riley, who um, I met here in Santa Fe, you introduced right. me here when you did Science Santa Fe. Right. And Bridget Riley will talk about a, uh, a painting of a particular color energy. And so that, again, is another thing for me to focus on. I mean, as work as a painter, there's so many things over the years. It just seems endless to be able to find something to focus on. So, and tone, is tone to painters, as it was tone poems of I mean, tone poems in music is a particular right. symphonic, a very particular symphonic type of structure. Um, tone in painting means something different, where it means to add grey, you know. Uh, <laughs> it means to tone things down, and I always did, I mean, for the most part, I did colour full volume. And when, right. I, when I started, I uh, lived in Vegas, I was younger, then, um, you know, I would do it full volume to be, not necessarily be taste, tasteful. Um, we sort of works where we were in Vegas. Right. It was, you know, it was always, this, and it was, if it's too loud, color wise, if it's too loud, you're too old, and it's get all, but now I'm old, so. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so now tone is something I can appreciate using more as a painter. Right. So. Do you, uh, so actually, Bridget is a pretty good example of one of my theories of artistic development. I um, have always felt that uh, painting especially, and especially American painting, develops in a grandfatherly way, which is if you're a painter at a certain moment and somebody is famous, then you're not going to do that. You're going to do the stuff that's been right before the stuff that's famous now. So Bridget is kind of like Kim's grandma. You know what I mean? And there's a whole, there's a whole thing, a whole movement of uh, of time and, and uh, analogies that tie that works together. And the most interesting thing for me is that, say, Tim is influenced by Bridget, but it doesn't, uh, but it doesn't mean anything like the same thing. You know, I mean, the, the meaning is gone, the, the little color tropes remain. And um, and that's one of the things about uh, about art that, that's, that's so hard to teach, which is uh, art changes, but the way it looks doesn't necessarily change. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, What it means changes. So what Tim's mean is different from what Bridget means. But they look a lot alike, you know what I mean? And maybe in a hundred years, they'll think, oh, Bridget and Tim, you know, whatever. Well, I, I think it's like what you said about the, the amazing thing about pop, the, the, to me about pop songs and music is that we notice them and we can tell them apart by such small incremental differences. Oh, I know. We distinctly know what they are, but really, when you when you particularly focus on it, it looks like the combinations are fairly limited. Right. But we can tell the difference, and and we do so in like very small increments. Right, and the same the same is, is true uh, with uh, paintings and uh, 
and uh, and music is just uh, little weird little things like the uh, what's that uh, Don Henley song uh, starts off with a little sustain, you know. Uh, Boys of Summer. Yeah. Boys of Summer. Uh, <laughs> Tim and I think of that. <laughs> um, I wouldn't uh, have thought that when we first met, though. Huh? I wouldn't have thought that when we first met. Well, I wouldn't have either, so we taught each other something. So, uh, but the, 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 the point is, is that you've got a, you've got a, a kind of, kind of art that stays pretty steady. You know what I mean? Uh, we don't, we always think of art as being so original. If you've seen as many Picassos as I have, you wouldn't think that. <laughs> you understand that? So it is, uh, the originality is really not the point. Yeah. Well, I would, you know, when I was younger and when I started and I was looking for what I wanted to do, um, and you can say it even more so today, it's like I wasn't looking to be the most transgressive artist when it seemed like transgression was what everyone did anyway. It was like, well, if everyone's broke, broken all the rules, all the rules, breaking the rules is not so much a big thing anymore. So I didn't think too much about, I wasn't looking for a way to break rules in big, drastic ways as it seemed like everyone right. uh, uh, looked to do from the big breaks in movements that we've been, get, we've been used to. And those breaks in movements are essentially artificial. They're art historian ideas, you know. Isn't everything going on all at once anyway? I mean, everything, to... all the time, all at once, yes. <laughs> that's been my experience. And, uh, and if you have a good friend that's a good painter who is not very famous, that just means what he does is not on the cycle this week. You know? um, everything stays pretty steady, I think. And um, which places a lot of a lot of uh, pressure on execution. And uh, I'm not saying prissy execution, but just on doing something that's different from the wall. Uh, you know, just something that's different from that thing. Uh, you don't have to, um, my darling, you want to sit down? Oh, does it bother you if I stand? No, not at oh. all. You can come up here if you can't hear me. No, I like to stand. I've got my hearing aids turned up to stun. So. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times I don't know what others can hear. Uh, so, but the, the 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 issue really is, I think. Uh, well, I was I was putting it like this. Um, 90% of the student and, you know, uh, out on the street art that's no good is no good because of its execution. Do, do you understand? It's not done in the right order. It's not done with the right care. It's not done with the right courage. You know, it's not outrageous in an interestingly outrageous way. And so, uh, so much, uh, so much art, and that's one of the things I like about Tim's art as it develops, is that it's it, it, that it's Tim just had decided, oh hell, I'll just be sloppy, you know what I mean? And uh, that makes it that makes it a little easier. Uh, it was too easier to be sloppy. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of hard to be sloppy. It would be for me. Uh, this, that's this hour stood out from my notes. Was by not being sloppy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, that's just so easy to do. Was that when Goldberg and all those people were out there? Was that, that, that that art center? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was at art center, it was definitely the choice I made. Um, I went to art center college in the eighties, and um, yeah, definitely. I I liked what Jeremy taught. 
Right. Um, Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe, an old teacher of mine, introduced me to Dave. That's how we first met. Right. And um, we met in Vegas in 95, and I wouldn't have gone to graduate school. I was commercial. I had a commercial art career. I thought I had to have a job, and Dave talked me into going to graduate school. So I'm exposed him to a lot of pain and viciousness that he shouldn't have been exposed to. <laughs> So we worked. We worked. We didn't care. We had a good time. But it is uh, it is one of the 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 things that and and I think if you, if you look at Tim's paintings here and presume that Tim is one of a graduate class of, of students, you understand very profoundly what one artist can do in a group. They can, Tim could keep everybody else from doing what he was doing. <laughs> do you understand? I mean, he could But Jack, Jack could do the same. That's right. Jack, Jack, Jack and like our could old do group. The same, but he could really close the door on him. Tim really closed the door on the stripes. And so. <laughs> Amongst my friends, I did. But we had, we had a good group, and that I would do, they all did similar. I would look right. at them and go, no, I would not do what. Aaron's doing, and Jack's right. doing, and Jack's doing. But it was a good group. It was a good group. Yeah. And uh, I liked it because nobody asked me any questions. <laughs> you know, I think Jack Halberg asked me if I knew a good mechanic. <laughs> that was about it. Uh, but the. Uh, the theory of these, do, do, do these have any kind of logical uh, theory to them? I mean, is there a reason one set follows another? One set, like in terms of like the bodies of work? Right, mean? like round ones and square ones and looped ones and <laughs> messy ones. And um, yeah, in, e in each moment, I mean, I think there was, um, with the curved ones, I'm again looking for and playing with a, another kind of musicality in the form, and maybe looking to make changes. And just I've tried a lot of different things over the years. Same with doing a, a round shape, or a, wanted to do tondos. Right. Is there you a know? tondo in there? Well, no, there's this, That's but it doesn't go. Tondo. But it doesn't. It's round, but it doesn't. It's a tondo in terms of painting, but it's not right. in terms of. In fact, if anything, the circular ones are more. In, I mean, the spirals are more the idea of a tondo for a painting, because they loop. Um, but yeah, there's usually there's usually some impetus for a little, you know body of paintings, um, uh, and I I usually have enough. Uh, and they get me, they get me going, and I sort of forget why I started. Well, also one of the things that happens. Uh, when everything dies, uh, I mean, when everything looks bad, uh, you, you almost inevitably have a, uh, a a kind of nostalgia that for the past that comes in, and some of which is good, like Tim's, and some of which is just awful, like that John Curry person, and. Uh, <laughs> And who is the other one that's just as awful? Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, what I mean is everybody, you know, the little fly doesn't always land on the same rows. And so, uh, the, uh, but, and what that means, and if you look at art right now, uh, I think that we're in the midst of, or on the verge of a very large paradigm shift. In other words, uh, I think it is possible to imagine that uh, the uh, the teaching of art in universities is about to disappear. I'm around universities; they can't get these students, and if they do, they can't do it. You know, and uh, and I think that you know the. The whole business of art is undergoing a, a transformation. Uh, it may look like a slaughter to you artists out there, but it's just a transformation. 
Yeah. 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 Um, it's, uh, and so then all of a sudden one day it'll all be changed, you know, and this is a, uh, one thing I always appreciated about Tim is that Tim was pretty much committed to what wasn't in fashion. You know, if I were uh, <clears throat> to tell a young artist what to do, I would say don't ever look at contemporary art. By the time you've done that, you'll be out of fashion. You know, it is, you know what do you want to do? Uh, rehashes of, uh, you know, uh, any of these people that show a Larry Gagosian, you, you don't want to do that. But you really got to, I mean, you got to not care about being in fashion or not. Right. Uh, but you can't, you just, I mean, whatever you do, you got to do what you want to do regardless of its stats in fashion. Right. And I like, I like Rauschenberg's idea. Rauschenberg's idea was that the, the past begins 40 years ago. <coughs> you know, so if you're working out of materials that are 40 years old, you're okay. You know what I mean? It's less than 40 years, mm, you don't know. It may just be a bunch of derivative stuff. And, um, and as you can see with Tim's things here, uh, it would be easy enough to walk out and say, oh, they're just a bunch of stripes. But they're a bunch of very different stripes. And they, 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 they speak in very different languages of color. And, uh, and they have their, uh, you know, they have their completion in very different ways. Uh, do you know what's happening in these when you start? Yeah, I have a fair, I have a fair idea. I mean, I have a good idea of how the um, how the, the the compositions work down and um, the color to some extent, but not how they'll finish. Because no matter how you, whatever material you make a sketch with, whether it's on a computer or it's in a different medium, when you make it out of paint, it, it becomes something different. So, so when you actually make the painting, you can't. And I would say the same, it doesn't matter if it's figurative, it doesn't matter where, right. whatever you make, you don't know until you're using the medium that the finished piece is going to be made. Right. Um, and the one reason I think, one of the reasons for making paintings that still um, makes, makes making paintings interesting is that there are so many things artists can do with paint that you can't, cannot do any other way. Right. So you can have a visual experience <coughs> Looking at paintings still today, that is, um, that can have surprises and be um, unlike anything else you'll experience anywhere else. You can't experience it in a book or on a, in a photograph or on a TV or on a screen. Um, so paintings may still have have something that um, that's something to offer in their physical um, experience here when you actually look at paintings. Right. I think they'll always maintain that. I don't know. I mean. There are things you'd like to look at, and things you don't, and those things change. But right. um, and I feel lucky to have been able to make paintings during a period of a real transition. With you know, when I was learning and we were in school, it wasn't that long ago that we weren't, as my students are, looking at reference on three-inch screens on phones. I mean, we right. had, um, I went to school, and that you know, I'm lucky. I feel lucky that you know. I, Deal with my students today and get them out of that so that they deal more with real experience. Well, it's really interesting because when um, when I started, and this comes from John Baldessari, you know, John uh, was an artist in Los Angeles who paints big sort of black and white photo ish paintings. And um, John just really didn't like it. Well, John Hodge, he said until he was out of high school, he thought works of art were little black and white things that were without this big in Art News magazine because they didn't have color, they didn't have color reproduction. And you can see the influence of those fantasy paintings in Art News magazine today in John's work. Yeah. And uh, so sometimes the style of dress to the work changes radically. I personally 
detached uh, digital imagery. I don't. Um, you you remember when you, the first thing you saw in like a graduate studio? Um, Dave told me a story where he walked in and I had um, I felt the same way and we didn't have this kind of ability to do digital research that's quite the same. And it's amazing. It wasn't that long ago. It was right before all of this. Um, and I had always had a, I've always had a practice. I still today I have a couple of things I'm working on, which are I make actual signs. I make copies and paintings. And you walked in and there's a big Edward Shea painting that looks to me and it's put, like I would see it in magazines and I, I would think, well, I can make it. Um, I want to see what uh, right. what it's like to see the real thing, the real size. So I would just make it, and because I couldn't tolerate the small image, I like to see, you know. And I go to Mocha and I saw paintings at Mocha in LA in a retrospective and thought well, I can make that, so I can live with the real thing and. Um, that's yeah, I thought nice Pixie reason. Red Seville Vegas place was pretty good, oh, the yeah. version of it. Yeah. And, you don't, and then you don't mind throwing it away. It's like that got that got that ended up getting messed up in the back of a garage. But right, um, well. But I've still got some nice ones. Um, uh, and you know, to to make a copy, that's an old tradition, isn't it? To make yeah. copies of works. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, you cannot you cannot. Um, you cannot replace the actual experience of looking at works of art. I don't, you know, digital hasn't and can't destroy that. And, right. Um, it's just uh, it, it, you got to see it, see it in person whenever you can because that's the magic. There's so. a show of Robert Ryman's uh, that, that were kind of painted in a kind of ivory on uh, that dark brown linen. You know, he's gesturing around in there with the linen kind of borders. And uh, what Robert was trying to do was do the same painting twice. And he just failed utterly. You know, I mean, he just couldn't do it. <laughs> and I think most people, very, it's very rare that you see it find an artist who can do the same thing? And you can't. You can't make an. You can't make an image of his work either. You have to see no. it. No. You have to see it. And uh, boy, those were beautiful paintings. And uh, that's that's they're among my early hits. You know, I mean, this was '66 or five or something like that. <laughs> <coughs> you, you saw the actual shows, and I saw yeah. the retrospective. You saw the retrospective. The Ad Reinhardt. Uh, there was a early on. <coughs> there was an Ad Reinhardt retrospective at Mocha in the early nineties. Rooms and rooms of the five by five foot black paintings that he made for the last twelve odd years of his life. I saw the black paintings, all the black paintings, at the Jewish Museum. It was about nineteen fifty five. And it sure cleared up my complexion. Uh, the relationship uh, between the work of art and the beholder is a lot more delicate than you think. And I hadn't thought about it until I saw those black paintings, uh, which is the. Uh, Figure out how to say this. 